Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to our town. Welcome to this independent episode. And the reason why I'm calling it an independent episode is because we've completed season one. We haven't yet started season two. This is a standalone episode. Uh, so it's an independent episode. And what happened was is that LNN put out a clip last week of Reb Gershon Rimner discussing the difference between a Bentaira and a Balabas. And a lot of people reached out uh, to LNN requesting there's a questionnaire. Ev Gershon mentions where uh, by going through those questions, you can help determine whether you're a Balabas or whether you're a Ben Yeshiva. It has nothing to do with whether you, you're in the workforce or whether you spend your day in Kailal. It has nothing, nothing to do with that. And I took this opportunity to sit down with Ev Gershon Rimner and go through those questions and discuss them. So uh, by listening and watching this episode... You will take out a pencil and a paper, <laughs> and you can determine what you are. Uh, I want to give a shout-out to Reb Gershon Rimner's book. I will put the link in the show notes uh, or at any Judaica store. You can see, see the book there. It's called Consequential Choices, and it's a, it's a great conversation piece for uh, Shabbos tables. I know people use it. Every chapter starts off with a uh, written like a novel with a new story, and then right by the climax, the story stops and says, like, it's always a big dilemma. And it said, what should Yankel do? And it gives you the options. And you think about it and discuss it. And then the next page of Gershon Rimner tells you what should be done from a Ben Yeshiva perspective and the reasoning behind it. So uh, it's very, very interesting. Um, take, pick up a copy of that. And uh, sit tight for season two. It's jam-packed. It'll be starting very shortly. So uh, for now, enjoy this episode with Rabbi Gershon Rimner. I'll catch you on the other side of the introduction. You are listening to Our Town, an LNN podcast. Meet the people who have transformed Lakewood from a small town into our town. I am your host, Mayor Dickstein. I want to thank Rosh Hashiva for this opportunity. My pleasure. We were discussing the difference between a Ben Yeshiva... And as the Rashiva calls it, an Orthodox Jew. I know that Lakewood started off when Rebaran came here and started Beis Medrash Gavoya. It was, for a long time, very much a yeshiva town, yeshiva community. And now we've grown well beyond the boundaries of Lakewood. I don't know if people call Lakewood the New Brooklyn. I don't know if it's still what it was. And I think this conversation can be fascinating. A self-awareness test to see where one stands um, on the Ben Yeshiva side, Orthodox Jew, or somewhere uh, in between. Sure. I, you know, as the days go further, it looks to me that more and more people are appreciating the Yeshiva movement and seeing it as possibly the greatest manifestation of Yiddishkeit. It's Machai of the most, and people are being drawn to it. And as people move more and more into Lake, when as Lake grows, it's a proliferation of the Shita and the Ruach of the Rosh Hashiva Zatzal and his Mam Shishim. And there are standards that are here in Lakewood that a person elevates himself and applies himself to those standards that he might have not even had even other good Mekayim Satayr, but this is something unique about Lakewood. So, um, what we were discussing then was there's such a thing as an Orthodox Jew and there's such a thing as a Ben Yeshiva. Now, a Ben Yeshiva is not limited to Lakewood. Every Yeshiva was Matzliya to a very, very large degree in creating and, and imbuing certain values and conduct and beliefs and ideals in the Talmudim. Many people spend some time in the yeshiva. If they left the yeshiva even in the late 20s, their formative years were spent in the yeshiva environment. They absorb these values and they go on to live a life that way. There are people who just re, were always uh, or just remain Orthodox Jews. And among the Orthodox, there can be many, many tzaddikim and many, many very early But the values that the leaders of the yeshiva movement tried to impart, that they might not have. They might not share those values. 
they might have other Erlachitin and other Madrigas, and there are Tzadikim and Bainim in each group. You know, the purpose of what we were discussing was more to try to bring to light and illustrate what are the particular ideals and values that the Bnei Yeshiva have that enrich them and make them and unify them and make them all one large group that are all living in a very similar ideal. I believe that the, when the Heliga Baal Shem Tev started Hasidus, there was a reason why, what was going on with the reform, there was a reason why uh, they chose to do that and create that movement. Was there any particular something that the yeshiva movement was established for? So you're talking about the yeshiva movement in this man of Rabbi Chaim That's what you're talking well, about. When we say Ben Yeshiva and the yeshiva ideals, where, where does that start? Right, it's Shavish was there. Then the purpose was to make sure that the people that are getting a Der Halimud and dedicating their lives to become G'dayli Meiri Hayra, G'dayli Atayra, Manhigi Adas, that's the Eric what Rabbi Chaim wrote in the letter that he penned to all Balabatim and to all communities about what his aim is for Balash. Now, any person who's going to come and dedicate their life to learning and coming with the plan to be a God will be soul, that immediately is Machayev, a whole different life, a whole different lifestyle, a whole different belief system, a whole different value system. Now, over the day, it's is Pesha Tzura V'Levish Tzura, and it's all basically the same ele- elevated status and mm-hmm. elevated level of dedication to Taylor values, but it does change from door to door. It's interesting that you pointed out, see, this was also that way. The way they see this was at the start and which people they were targeting. It took a big change when it moved over the, to Poland, when people there were much more learned, bigger than the there were times that it always centered around the Rebbe, and then there were times that the individual accomplishments was very important also, was very critical. It wasn't enough just to to be bottled to a Rebbe. It, it also changed to accommodate, but there was something to accommodate the different groups, the different uh, continents of different centuries. However, there was something that was um, a common thread among all of it. So that's what we have today. Look up the, the movement of the Meshivas also. There is a common thread that unifies it, but there are changes, minor changes in how it's adapted. Let's see, in the times of Chaim Alosha, there was no Kehila at large or Balabata Shekhila that were going to hotels for Yantif. That wasn't part of what... But the dedication of applying to your principles and how to live a Yantif, that he was teaching that was imbued. Just what the points that you're, you know, we differ and we make an effort and we make the different particular sacrifices that, you know, that could change in its application from time to time. So if we were to invite a Ben Yeshiva from 100 years ago onto our podcast, he would look very different than a Bishmajish Gavoya Avrech? Only on the Chitzanias, not on the Pemis. Not on the people. Of course, there's the Yeridis and Teiris. Oh, you know, what level of commitment, what is Teiris, Lavidos, Eliros, Eliros, Eliris. But no, I would hope not. I would hope it wouldn't be that way. I would hope in the premiers they would feel like a fish in water. And I'd be more concerned the other way. Take him in Teir today and plant him in Velazhin in 1825. Would he fit in? Would he be accepted? Would he know how to learn? Would he know how to carry himself? Would he have the dedication that, that would be up to par? So again, the Ziyarid is Adairas, but I would hope that he would have somewhat enough in common, that he would not be an outcast if we have a real dedicated yeshiva. So can we compare the yeshiva movement to Hasidus or Hasidim? That means that they have their ideologies and we have the yeshiva ideologies. Is there ever a time when uh, a Rosh Hashiva or a Rebbe would say, I think you're better off with their ideologies or would benefit better from that? Like, you should, you should proceed to, to, you know, get yourself involved in... The primacy of learning is very important in the Yeshiva. And they'll only push somebody to a different movement only if they see this child can't do it. He just is not an academician, and they don't believe it's going to happen. But they would try anything they could to bring out the academianship and the ability to do that. 
But that prim- the primacy of learning, that's something that they can have even that one. Now, among the seed there are many people that prioritize in the learning, but that's not what the movement is saying. They want to say this and Vamkait and Asis and Mitzvahs and longing for closeness to the Rabbi Hashem and, and, you know, they're emphasizing different things. You know, it was um, a number of years ago, I met a Hashri that was in his late 60s. He was a Magad Shir and went to Chesidah Shishiva. And he told me that when he was a young boy, like a teenager, he was living in Bnei Barak, and there was a whole Chabur that used to learn by Rabbi Chaim Aaron Turchin. That was a Talmud of the Gris. I had a yeshiva in Rishlein at that time. And there was a whole group of Chesidah Shabbat that were in that yeshiva. And he said that he would always, they would always fight and argue with Reb Chaim Aaron about this derech and that derech. And one day, one of the boys found in one of the real fundamental seditious forum, at the moment I don't remember which safe it was, that said that the site of everything is a Baivarov. And he goes over to Rabbi Chaim that's all, and he shows him that sentence, opens up the Sefer to that. And the boy says, so what's the way the between us and you? We're all believing the same thing. The seed of everything is a Bible. Look what it says in this Chesidah Sefer. And Rabbi Chaim Aaron looked at it, and he said, right here is the chile between us and you. But you, it's the seed of everything. But if the seed is a binion, and there's another claim and another claim, and that's not all I have. The Yisait is a man. By us, it's not only the Yisait. It's every floor. The entire binyan is all of I have. Beginning, middle, and end. Right. So he said, right here is the Shalik. What you're showing me. Beautiful. Okay, so I guess we can um, take a look at some of the questions. So let's go through the introduction here. And then uh, everyone at home can take out a pencil and a paper. <laughs> and you can see, we, we stand. It is not the intent of the questionnaire to anoint members of the yeshiva movement with the status of tzaddikim and uh, the rest of orth- Orthodox Jewry to Bainini status or worse. There are tzaddikim and Bainini in both groups. There are, however, stark differences in the ideology and values of the two groups regarding issues not pertaining to Issa Beheter, and the intent and purpose of this questionnaire is to highlight and emphasize those differences in order to bring to light the quality and richness of the values transmitted to us by the Mahigim of the Elam Heshivas, so that we may strive to reach greater heights. It should be noted that this questionnaire will be inclusive for people who have a strong Chassidic background, even if they are not practicing Chassidim, as some of their sentiments may overlap with the ideology of the Yeshiva movement, with, uh, although for cultural and not ideological ideological reasons. Right, that's an important point, that it will be inconclusive, inconclusive. for the high yeah. group. They have many values in common. It might be from a different Shavish, but it's more like the, for the American group, the American Orthodox. So some of their ideologies manifest itself similar to, to a Ben Yeshiva, but it's for different reasons. It's not... Uh... Okay, here goes. Question number one. Do you feel the responsibility of supporting Yeshivas and Kailam equally to that of essential organizations such as High Lifeline, Bnei Olam, and Hatzalah, is it more critical or less critical? So I'd assume that the the uh, reason the what this question is leading towards is that the a, a Ben Yeshiva would value Yeshivas and Kailam uh, it's equally or even more than Hatzalah, High Lifeline, Bnei Olam, etc. Does this border on halacha of where your tzedakah money goes? Yeah, it is a little questionable in halacha. Like, if you already have a chayla, so then the psak is the money goes to the chayla, not to the support of it. If there's no chayla yet, and you're thinking of building a hospital or building yeshiva, that's when they'll first build a yeshiva. When there's already a chayla, then for sure the money is to the bikur nefesh. But that's only because to, let's say, high lifeline and um, Hatzalah. But let's say Bayan, which is a tremendous, important course. People's lives are so bitter, and but they might prefer yeshiva over that. They might prefer the building of yeshiva. It's very well known what the Rabbanon was doing with the funds from Hatzalah. And he was printing copies of the Talmud for it. 
And, you know, I'm not sure if everybody could agree to him about him. Everybody in the Holy Sheep movement, if they agree to him or not, but his psak is a big psak. And even the ones who didn't agree, they still favor this over many other great organizations. They still would favor more mechanism. Uh, uh, they look at that as the chayim and the chiyas of Kleinsol. They look at it that that is like vital. And, you know, we know the Raman Paskins, Chayi Bali Chokma, Bali Chokma, Kimesim Heim Shuvim. So they look at that as very vital and that the Kim and the Nisiris of Kleinsol is contingent on the proper Madrigas which needs Mukhaim Zatari and Shivas and Khanak systems. Yeah, I think she was particularly have a hard time with fundraising. Yeah, of course. Okay, number two. When giving charity, is it proper to give preference to Torah scholars or must all impoverished people be treated equally? What if the scholars are in need of something less essential, such as clothing, and the others are in need of food? So if you play at the case, we have a Tamil Chacham who's... Hungry, who needs who needs clothes? Doesn't have uh, clothing, and we have impoverished people who need food. So I guess what we're saying here is that a ben yeshiva would help the tam chacham buy clothing and leave the impoverished people starving, hungry. And everybody else would resent that, and they're not aware that Ramo says this. And they wouldn't be aware of it, or they find some place that go differently, but they would resent it. What is this? And the Bnei Yeshiva understand this. And they believe it. Right. As long as it's not a Pekuch Nefes situation, right. we can, right. And I guess we draw the line somewhere, right? We don't go all the way till we buy the Bnei Yeshiva Tesla. We have to know, right? get the clothes. No, well, yeah, what he needs, you know, we're all talking about needs. We're not talking about extras. Yeah. If he's taking stock, he can't be very extras. Number three, would you postpone or cancel altogether a much-anticipated and carefully planned vacation so that your child doesn't miss even a single day of cheder, would it at least be a significant consideration? There's definitely miles to family vacations, <laughs> um, but a ben yeshiva sees the importance of a child going to cheder. I guess more by boys than by girls. Uh, the Orthodox world also understands the importance of cheder, but that it's every day, and missing a day is such a big deal. That's what they don't perceive. So is it that a, we're talking about like elementary school kids, is it that, you know, the child who left for vacation and the, the Ben Yeshiva who stayed at Cheder, they're not going to come out differently? Is it just that day's Talmud Taira that we're worried about? No. When the Ramam says, Kesa Taira means he's Zohar B'chol Leilo Yisof. Val Yehiva Nafilo Achasme. No. It's a big difference if you have a cancer or you don't have a cancer. There's not one day. It's a lifetime. Do you have a cancer or you don't have it? That's a big deal. And that's how the Shiva lights are mechonic with. With the Rambam. That's the famous word of Rabban that a cancer that's missing a jewel is not just missing a jewel. It destroys the cancer. So, in and on every level, on the Tamil Chacham, it's every Laila, on the Chadaram children, it's Kafi Madri Gossip, it's every day of Cheda, but they would take it very seriously. So, here's where I think we'd run into issues. Um, a child who's, whose father's in Kailal, so typically the Bainas Manam of Yeshiva aligns with the school system. When a child has a father who's a Baal Bas and it doesn't align, so then, uh, you know. It's a lot easier for the for the killing a man to plan his trips accordingly. Sure, there is a difficulty in this, but but we're not talking about killing a light and working people. There are many, many working people that will live the life mm-hmm. in B'nai Teira, even though they're not on that schedule. They're influenced from the Yeshiva movement, and they would take it very seriously. Possibly they would make sure they have themselves a big seder with the boy if they took him out of Cheda and live with him a few hours a day. Possibly they make sure there's someone else there teaching them, but it's a very serious consideration. I mean, the most that he writes over here is that it should be strongly considered. Not just be washed away, oh, just a few days, what's the big deal? That, that's just not the attitude. If once you look at the Talmud as Chaim Loilam, you cannot just, just with a wave of a hand, ignore a few days. It's just out of the question. So it's that, it's that commitment and that belief system that gives birth to this difference. Yeah, I was wondering what was going through the minds of the uh, the Menahalim of the, of the local Chadar when they added an extra day of, of yeshiva. Like, 
can inconvenience the parents as well as the Rebbeim, everyone from the top down. But this is obviously the thought process. That's the thought process. I mean, the counter swara is you have to make sure the boys are happy and you can't work them to death and turn them off by such severe and strict. So, you know, that's always the back and forth. But in both them, the aim is the slacha of the children of the faith. The question is just what's going to be more slacha. But that is the aim, not, the, not anybody's vacation. That's not the aim. Okay, number four. Is it more severe to make a chil Hashem in front of Goyim or in the presence of fellow from Yidin? So that goes into the question of what exactly is a chil Hashem. Um, and the tr- translation would be, you know, to profane Hashem's name. Um, and what causes that? So I guess what this question would would be referencing is that possibly an Orthodox Jew would think of a Chil Hashem as any time a non-Jew may look at him as strange or different or out of the norm. When a Ben Yeshiva or, you know, we look at a Chil Hashem as any time we're doing something that is not aligned with our values and what Hashem wants from us. But, yeah, that is some truth to that. They're a little bit less concerned what the guy think. But it's more of a legal point that the Pazi says, Now there are many psukim and nach that Hashem sounds like he's worried about Chil Hashem Bein Ha'goyim. And Gez Lakam is also Mishum Chil Hashem and that's Chil Hashem Bein Ha'goyim. There is such a thing. But what's more important is to impact on a fellow Jew, on his mind, on his matriga. That's more important that he should be aware and fully in touch with the Asherinu Matayv Chilkenu. That's more important. The guy is largely an Ava issue and things like that. It's not, it's not, it's not of the same kind, not as consequential. So that's why they'll all be much more concerned about Achil Hashem Be'ine Yisrael. It's not only that, it's Be'ine, not a Freyid, Be'ine Fomid. When you have a Yid at Sadiq and a Goyen, that does everything perfect, like the daily soul that we know of. They are made Kaddish and Shemayim and Mechazek avoided by all the Shlumi and Muni soul. Anybody in the Mechitza or Apam or Shlomo Zalman or many, many different daily soul, they themselves just are nice and leave them Mechazek Yesu Yesu. They're walking Kiddush Hashem and that Kiddush Hashem among Kiddush and Tahirim is to them very important. The care of Kiddush and Tizkadosh. That is very important. That's not the, uh, the old uh, Jew looks at it. Well, either way, he's a good for me. Like, so what's the big deal? This Madriga, that Madriga. Why is that so important? What, why is that the big deal? Yeah, I think that typically what happens is that when we're in a public setting, people c- pull the Chil Hashem card. Eh, it's a Chil Hashem. Make sure you don't, you know, speak too loudly, leave garbage on the floor. It's a Chil Hashem. So we kind of got into, you know, in our mind, we think of Chil Hashem as that. It's a very complicated question because... Anything the goyim are not happy with. Let's say the halacha is that shor shel akum should nogach shor shel yisrael is chayev, and yisrael should nogach shor shel akum is part. No, no guy is happy with this halacha. So we have to hide the halacha mishum chil hashem, or we stand up and say our Torah is right. There's a reason for this, and there's a justification for this, and we can give you the justification whether you like it or not. This is stuff they don't want to hear. Does that make it a Chalashem? Is that, or we have to stand up for what the Torah says and the Torah values. Right. So that's also a big difference. You know, all the time, he was not comfortable doing that. He was always trying to be made to clean and buckle his knees just to, you know, calm to. Yeah, on a smaller scale, um, where I live in Jackson, there was a Chalashem to say for Torah. And all the going weren't very happy, you know, a lot of noise on Sunday afternoon. So people may think of that as a Chil Hashem, but on the contrary, that's like, a, you know, a, a, the epitome of, you know, it's Kish Hashem. But see, but that's rights that people have for quiet. You know, yeah, I would have to think about that. You know, you can't build a house on Sunday. You can't have a tractor trailer. I mean, yeah, you know, so, you know, you know, that, so uh, we don't look at it as a tractor trailer, but that, yeah, that's an issue of rights. But, um, but you have the idea. That's right. Number five. Are you greatly disturbed by the prospect of your teenage son smoking and ready to take drastic measures to prevent or stop it? Or is it something you find reason to turn a blind eye toward? So is number five hinting that the Bnei Shiva uh, gives a heter on smoking? 
there is no parent in the right mind that is happy their son is smoking, and no boy who is a badass is smoking. No question about it. But what he's talking about over there is that the the, the yeshiva man will have a reason to turn them to turn a blind eye, and not to fight it with everything he has at his means. And the reason for that is because the yeshiva man is demanding so much from his son. He's demanding first say the second say the night say the. He's demanding he wake up early and go to davening. He's he's demanding a halacha say the before after davening and a musa say the, and a supper shared to finish the masechta. The amount that he's crushing his kid and demanding, he wants it, every mentor wants his son to be the god Hadar and envisions that his son could be the god Hadar. And these are the demands he's making, or at least encouraging him. And the, and the Mekayim is that he's sending him are so intense. So he has to look away from something. If the kid starts turning to smoking, but he's still doing what the parents want him, they can't, they just, they, they, it's not could die for them to fight it. They hope that in a year or two he's going to outgrow it, and hopefully they have to turn the blind eye. An Orthodox Jew is not demanding any of this from his son. He's demanding him to be a mensch. And a mensch don't smoke. It just don't make sense. He's not demanding any of this. No, no, no he's not demanding his son has to finish the Masifta during his supper shear. During that hour, he's got to go to another shear. I write notes. Who's demanding anything like that? So he's demanding basically starting and end. Uh, you got to be a mensch. Of course, he can use all the means at his disposal to crack down on the smoking. But the yeshiva man and the orthodox, they're both the same in how much they don't like the smoke. The question is, if, like he says, it is reason to turn a blind eye. You can't fight every battle. So and picking your battles. And the learning triumphs over everything. So the question is, where do you draw the line? What's if a bacher is not keeping personal hygiene? Where do you draw the line? Well, personal hygiene, the guys. It's, well, any it's bad not habit. A match. This is an uh, unhealthy thing. It's a little, a little bit of a different world. Uh, any bad habit that that someone might have, you have to pick your battle. The question. Let's see. He doesn't line. rest. He's not neat. They'll look away from it. If they feel that's his teva, it's not worth to make the fight of it. It's not worth to rob his attention and to make such a yes and no battle. You can't fight every battle. So so what if his collar was a little taped? It's just not where it is. And more than that. They're working a lot on building the pneum of the boy. They're not really building, building the chitzayin of the boy that much. So, you know, that they would take is less significant also. Smoking is significant, but they just uh, have to turn a blind eye. But if he's, you know, you know how presentable he is and all that, that's, that'll be easy, man. So I guess we're sacrificing some of the menstrual kite to have the buffer. Uh, uh, not menstrual kite when you're talking about real values. Me to save is not that. That almost been vato on that. You know, menstrual kite in the real sense, nobody's been vato on that. The heritage is called Motera and the every Shiva knows that. Who called this menstrual kite? The Balabat's been calling this menstrual kite. It's not the Shiva guys that calling menstrual kite if his collar is this way or that way, or his hat is pushed up backwards, or if he, if he hasn't brushed it. That not calling that. The Shiva not calling that. Yeah, menstrual kite, not menstrual kite. They're dealing with much more consequential things. Number six. Would it be intolerable for you to send your son to a high school where there are no secular studies? Or would his, would his advancement and development in Lima Taira trump all other considerations? So do we value secular studies? That's, that's, that's the question. So Ben Yeshiva wouldn't value secular studies. Um, I guess the idea would be for just to know enough to get by. Well... Yeah, that is true. I mean, most of what is taught currently in high schools are really a preparation for college. They're not really... He doesn't need to be in a laboratory in order to know how to live life. There are many things he doesn't need to have that. That's the difference between Lakewood and Brooklyn, even among his year Brooklyn parents are not prepared yet to give up the English. They're not prepared to give it up. And they still look at it just part of like just being a mensch. Uh, Lakewood was very much in the lead of this. I mean, many, many yeshivas in Lakewood gave up the English for the uh, for the high school. So that's even a difference between Lakewood yeshiva and Elvis. Uh, in Brooklyn, there, w- there was one, I think I played Malm, 
was the first one to make a high school taught English. And the Agadeo Teira today that were in his program, like Rabbi Avram Bramberg, Rabbi Lechaim, Swartloff, they were in that program. He was very much late. Years later, Rabbi Hutner Zatzal also took two groups for four years and no English. And I don't know if he was as much late as Rabbi was, but besides from this, all over there is English there. But the mindset over here is that his atzlocha and learning triumphs of everything. Additionally, nowadays nobody perceives the knowledge of the secular subjects as a vehicle to get parasa. Nobody sees that anymore. I think even college itself, college people itself. go to and get degrees, doesn't help them. You know, right. The actual... They do less than the sharp business people. They have to, yeah. to go to boot camp. So people have be, yeah, began to see that, so... So why would they still want English? Because they feel in order to be a mensch, you have to know that. That but they do not believe. I think it's another spin with Herb Shmuel in Philadelphia. Whatever you do, you have to do right. So if we're going to do English, we're all in. So that's a different spin on it. Number seven. Do you consider attending a sporting event in a stadium to be an appropriate form of recreation? I think it would be different you know, back in the day. I believe that Pir Hegelis Yisrael would take people to, to the games, and nowadays just because of preachers and other reasons not. But this question is probably referring to just even if it was all kosher, the actual idea of going to a stadium. I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. I think what you said is right. But like, um, he is going to tell you, but I'm so afraid of that. Yeah, what's so terrible about owning a pet? Like, why no yeshiva might even go into and tell a pet? Because he looks at it, if the dog is your best friend, you're in trouble. What do you have in common with the dog? What do you have in common? You are Matthias Ruchni, Matthias Nitzri, or Matthias, uh, such an elevated Matthias, and this is an Az Palam, Klob Mazin Efesh. What do you have in common? How does it give you any friendship? How does it give you any satisfaction? That's how they look at it. It's a dog, or is it any extra? No, know, fish tank that that, like, that, because it's not trying to be your friend. So that uh, you know, that's a beauty that they like. Twelve. If an individual is equally and uniquely gifted at teaching in a cheder and that curve, toward wh- towards which endeavor should he dedicate the bulk of his talents? So, cheder uh, or curve, and he's obviously he's talented in both. I wonder if there's as many people talented in Kerv as there is in Cheder. I, I, I guess we can say maybe go to Kerv if he has that talent. And we have many people who can do the Cheder. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, that is one way of thinking. The other way of thinking is that it's a bigger accomplishment to raise and educate and influence a godly soul. And the Mala people who are already... On a mile and bring him to a bigger mile. It's a big accomplishment. Yeah. Okay. I guess this is, it's not a situation with Malcolm Shane ish, obviously. Yeah, that could be so, other considerations. That there's nobody, like you're saying, Malcolm Shane, that could be other considerations. But that's if they value, in, you know, let's say the Orthodox Jew will look at it, this kid is from many ways. Like, what's the big deal? But every Madriga, we are ready to kill for. Every mile. That's a very bad way of looking at things. But many it's every mile is going to be my synapse. So if you can be mild and more, you feel you have that ability. You cannot uh, just then divert it to Kiev. Although Kiev is an important thing. I mean, all my things are recognized and support. Would you name your child after a, a beloved but irreligious uncle? I guess this would mean that a Ben Yeshiva would say, son who's irreligious, we're not going to have any zakr of him. Because they well, look at exactly. your religion and you as one. Of, there's no you and the religion. There's no, it's not like, oh, well, he was a loving uncle. He's a terrific guy, you know. If you if you are you that without Shabbos, if you are you that's not declaring the unity of the Rebbein Shem, you're worthless. We throw you out of the camp. We hope for you. We misspell for you. We try to be a of you, but I'm saying now he's dead, right? We we just don't look at him. He lives a few a few empty life. So we don't say this is the last. Way we could give him some success somehow, something. So maybe you learn some shnayis from him, give a stock of him, but give okay. the name is not saying no. He's giving a certain as he access and sheep is that. Beautiful. Okay, yeah. I mean, there's tons to talk about. So what do you say if you 
scored an 80 on this, that means you are a vendor, huh? What's it's that? 80 or more. I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah, these are different things. It's just awareness. So, uh, but, yeah. Yeah, there's another whole group that we are not getting to, and that is the observance of the festivals. Yeah, okay. Do we have that over here? They have it here in the back, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, there's another whole, a whole, uh, like a whole, a whole issue. As you go through the questions, you'll see what a Shabbos table looks like, what a Yom table is, like. yeah, what's important. Beautiful. All these concepts. Okay, it's been All a right. pleasure. Thank man. you, it's thank you, appreciate pleasure. it. Thanks so much. And I hope there's been some things clarified. For me. There you have it. Now you can determine whether you are a Orthodox Jew or you are a Ben Taira. Um, so sit tight. We will be back with season two very shortly. We're ready to record a lot of episodes and it's going to be jam-packed, so I'll catch you at a later point. Bye-bye.